Hi everyone, welcome to lecture 9 of CHM202 Colloidal Surface Chemistry. In this lecture, we'll be looking at liquid air interfacial phenomena. We'll look at surface tension and its consequences. Uh, in particular, we'll look at drops, bubbles, and cavities. We'll look at capillary, uh, capillarity and wicking, walking on water floating on water. After the lecture, I expect students to be able to define surface tension and describe its origin. I expect them to be able to name and describe the consequences of surface tension. I expect them to be able to derive the young Laplace equation. I expect them to be able to derive the Kelvin equation and name its consequences. I expect them to be able to perform simple calculations in relation to the derived formula. Surface tension is also known as liquid air interfacial tension. By definition, surface tension is force per unit length acting perpendicularly on an imaginary line drawn in the surface of a liquid. The SI units for surface tension are Newton per meter, joule per meter squared, dying per centimeter, and you should note that 1 joule is equal to 1 newton meter and 1 dying per centimeter is equal to 1 millinewton per meter. So, what is the origin of surface tension? Let's just take um, um, a liquid uh, which is in a container, for instance. So, some liquid molecules would be in the surface of the liquid, where others would be in the bulk of the liquid. So molecules in the bulk of the liquid, we experience attractive and repulsive forces in all directions, as opposed to those in the surface, which we not. And this is what I mean. This is the liquid, this is the bulk liquid, this is the surface, and this is air with some liquid molecules in it. Um, at this point, you can see that the molecules in the bulk of the liquid have attractive and repulsive forces in all directions. You see, that's why I've indicated that with uh, the six arrows. You can compare this with those in the surface of the liquid which experience this forces in only one direction. So, in the bulk, the attractive forces dominate over the repulsive forces, but the overall uh, effect is that the molecules, um, uh, the molecules uh, have um, an overall force uh, of zero over time. So, the potential energy of a molecule is lowered when it interacts with its neighbors, uh, nearest neighbors, so to say. Um, that is to say, the intermolecular forces stabilize the system, um, and such forces are known as the cohesive forces. This can be compared with the adhesive forces, which are the forces of interaction uh, between uh, the liquid molecules and air, as well as other bounding surfaces. The cohesive forces between the liquid molecules and the bulk are higher than the adhesive forces between the air and the liquid molecules on the surface. As a result, there is a force imbalance that leads to a net inward force in the bulk of the liquid. And this net inward force does um, cause the liquid surface to stretch, or rather tension, as though it were covered with an elastic membrane. Secondly, it tends to pull the surface molecules, which are more energetic, uh, into the bulk uh, phase where the molecules are less energetic. If we consider the potential energy of the bulk liquid molecules as zero, then the surface molecules 
have positive potential energy, which is characterized by the surface tension, uh, which in this case is surface potential per surface area. So what are the consequences of this net inward force? Uh, so to say, first the net inward force results into surface tension. Secondly, work must be done against the force in taking a molecule from the bulk to the surface. Secondly, the net inward force causes the surface of the liquid to shrink and energy is required to extend it. So, the consequences of surface tension. Firstly, liquid drops, air bubbles and cavities are spherical. And this is the geometry that minimizes their surface area. Now, what are drops? What are bubbles and cavities? Drops are spheres of a liquid in equilibrium with their vapor. A bubble is either a region in which air or vapor are trapped by a thin film or a cavity full of vapor in a liquid. Ordinary bubbles have two surfaces, an inner one and an outer one, uh, while cavities have only one surface. Drops and bubbles are stable at equilibrium because the tendency to decrease their surface area is balanced by the rise in the internal pressure. Let us consider the case of a relatively stable air bubble in a liquid. This is the air bubble, this is the inner surface, this is the outer surface. So this is what happens. This is pressure acting on the bubble to decrease its size. And this is another. Um, this is the atmospheric pressure acting to increase, uh, decrease the size of the uh, bubble. And this is the internal pressure of the bubble, uh, trying to resist this uh, decrease in size. So let P sub I be the internal pressure responsible for expansion, um, which is this and P sub naught be the external pressure, atmospheric pressure responsible for contraction. R be the radius of the air bubble, and let's take it to be one surface, um, although here I have said bubbles have two surfaces, inner and outer, let's take it to be a single surface. Gamma sub LA represent the surface tension of the liquid, so that a small change uh, does an increment in the radius of the bubble from say r to r plus the r will be accompanied by a small change in the surface area of the bubble. Uh, we can approximate the surface area of the bubble to a sphere. Uh, and in that case, the surface area becomes 4 pi r squared. So for a small change, let's say this change, we substitute it into this expression, and we have this. We take the difference between the new uh, size, the new area in the old one, and it gives us the change in area. We expand this term in parentheses to obtain this. And we further expand this term in the square brackets to obtain equation 3. And that bit is nakedly small. That cancels out, leaving us with the change in area to be approximately equal to 8 pi r dr. So the work done in the process um, is the surface tension times the change in area. So we simply substitute the change in area there and we obtain equation 4. The force opposing the stretching through the distance r, in this case, is equal to 
uh, the top layer, which is work done in the process divided by the change in R, and that gives equation 5. The outward force is equal to the internal pressure times the area, and the internal pressure is P sub I, while the area is 4 pi R squared. The inward force is equal to the outward pressure times area, and in the same way, the area is 4 pi R squared, and the outer pressure is P sub naught. So the total inward force is the, the inward force plus the force opposing the, the stretching of the bubble. So at equilibrium, the total inward force is balanced by the total outward force. So we substitute the total inward force and the total outward force and we obtain equation 9. We divide equation 9 also by 4 pi r squared. Um, we obtain equation 10. Um, if we did that, that cancels that, that cancels this, that cancels that one. And that goes there twice, and we end up with this expression uh, P sub i equal to P sub naught plus 2 gamma LA all over R. We rearrange this expression to obtain P sub i minus P sub naught equal to change in P equal to 2 gamma sub LA divided by R. That's equation 11. And this is the Laplace or Young Laplace equation. Now, for a soap bubble with two surfaces, the Laplace uh, equation or Young Laplace equation uh, becomes 4 pi, 4, 4 gamma LA divided by R, which is equation 12. And a change in P is the Laplace or Young Laplace equation. Uh, from equation 11, this equation in 12, we can see that the Laplace pressure is inversely proportional to the radius of the bubble. That is to say that smaller bubbles have higher Laplace pressure than bigger ones. And this explains why uh, when a bottle of champagne is open, it's louder than you open a bottle of say beer. And this is because the bubbles in beer have the radius of about less than 0.1 millimeter, while those in beer have a size or radius rather greater than 0.1 millimeter. Now, because of the difference in pressure between the smaller and the bigger bubbles, materials will flow into the larger bubble of lower pressure when they are connected. And this is what um, actually happens. Yeah, let's take a case where we have um, this is one soap bubble and this is another soap bubble. So these soap bubbles are connected um, by a three way tap. This is the pressure for the small soap bubble, um, a piece of one, and that is for the, uh, the radius for the bubble. This is the pressure for the big soap bubble, and this is the radius of the small soap bubble, the big soap bubble, so to say. So the difference between the pressures within the bubbles is actually, say, P1 minus P2, which is equal to the change in pressure 
uh, we substitute based on the Laplace equation uh, 2 times gamma sub LA divided by R sub 1 minus 2 times gamma sub um, LA divided by R sub 2. This can be uh, simplified into 2 times gamma sub LA because these are common into 1 all over R sub um, 1 minus 1 all over R sub 2. Yeah, so let's see what happens. Um, there is a video here of a case where two uh, soap bubbles are connected. I got this video from a website called Physics uh, Reimaged uh, from a university in Paris. I'm going to play the video now. Yes, that is a soapy solution. That formation of the big drop, the bigger one, compared to this one, which is smaller. So that is connected. You can see the big bubble increasing in size while the small one decreasing. That material flow from the small one to the big one. And that is the consequence of Laplace pressure. So when the top is connected, uh, the smaller one shrinks while the bigger one uh, grows until the curvature of both bubbles become the same. Uh, I should mention to you that equation 1 can also be used to calculate the Laplace pressure in a liquid drop. So what happens is as the change in pressure uh, approaches zero, as R approaches infinity, that is to say that um, when the surface is flat, the meaning of this is that a pressure differential exists only across the curved interface. How do we then find the Laplace equation for the case of a non-spherical interface? If you have a non-spherical interface, what happens? How do you find the um, Laplace equation? Two red eye of curvature are required. See R sub A and R sub B. To find the Laplace pressure of a non-spherical interface. Let's say a soap thing between two wire loops. This is one wire loop. This is the second one. And this is a soap thing indicated by the red curve. Let's take this to be an interface, a curved one, which is non-spherical. Let's take this to be another one, um, a non-spherical interface as well. Uh, I should have mentioned to you that this is the procedure for obtaining the radar of curvature between uh, for non-spherical interfaces. So these are two spherical non, uh, two non-spherical interfaces, A and B. The first thing to do is to draw a normal at the point where the two interfaces intercept. Next is to draw a plane across the normal. And this plane is through the, the, the interface A we draw another one perpendicular to the first plane, um, which is normal to it. Next, we draw circles across the planes. And then we get the red eye of the planes. Positive values 
are assigned to the radar of curvature if they lie in the concave side where negative values are assigned when they lie in the convex side. So for the soap fin between two wire loops, to illustrate just what we've done, R sub A lies in the convex side, side rather, and it takes negative value, which is equal to R sub B. R sub B lies in the concave side, and it takes a positive value. That's why we have R sub A A. So R sub A is equal to negative R sub B. So the Laplace equation for the system is given by equation 14, which is change in pressure equal to gamma LA into 1 all over R sub A minus 1 all over R sub B, uh, which is equal to 2 times R, uh, 2 times gamma sub uh, LA all over R sub M, where 1 all over R sub M is equal to 1 all over 2 into 1 all over R sub A minus 1 all over R sub B. And 1 all over R sub M is equal to the mean curvature. Our next task now is to derive the curving equation. Yeah, so the Kelvin equation is an equation that relates the vapor pressure of the liquid drop to its radius. And what experiments have shown is that the vapor pressure above a planar liquid is different from the one above a curved uh, surface. So what the Kelvin equation does is to relate how that vapor pressure around the curved surface depends on its radius. So let's take this to be a liquid drop. So R to be the radius of the liquid drop gamma sub LA be the surface tension of the liquid, rho, uh, density of the liquid, V sub M of L be the molar volume of the liquid, and V sub M of G be the molar volume of the vapor. So the equilibrium condition is that the chemical potentials of the vapor phase and that of the liquid phase has to be equal. That is the chemical potential of the inner phase must be equal to the chemical potential of the outer phase. And that is to say the chemical potential of the liquid has to be equal to the chemical potential of the gas. So for a small change for a small change in the chemical potential of the liquid will lead to a corresponding small change in the chemical potential of the gas phase. So we can write the chemical potential in terms of the molar volume and based on the fact that uh, the ch chemical potential, uh, change in chemical potential divided by change in pressure at constant temperature is equal to molar volume. If the vapor behaves like an ideal gas that is perfect, then we can apply the ideal gas equation. And of course, this is the pressure of the liquid, this is the pressure of the vapor. And that leads to equation 19, 
if the vapor is perfect. So this bit represents the ideal gas equation. So this equation can be rearranged uh, to obtain this bit of the equation. So let's take this to be the planar interface where the vapor pressure is P sub 1 of G, where the pressure of the liquid is P sub 1 of L. And this should be the curved interface, where P sub 2 of L represents the pressure of the liquid, and P sub 2 of G represents the vapor pressure across the curved interface. If we integrate uh, this equation, equation 19, along these limits of pressure, um, as in equation 20, we obtain equation 21. <coughs> Sorry, um, equation 21, uh, where V sub M of L represents the molar volume of the liquid times the uh, change in pressure all over R um, T equal to the natural log within of the pressure at P2 of the gas divided by P1 of the gas. Of course, this is a compressed version um, of this. So this is the pressure difference across the planar and the liquid drop interface, which represents the Laplace pressure, which is given by 2 times gamma sub LA all over R, and V sub M of L represents uh, the molar volume, which is equal to molar mass of the liquid divided by the density. If this and this expression are substituted into this bit of the equation will obtain equation 22. And equation 22 is the uh, Laplace, uh, sorry, the Kelvin equation for the liquid drop. For the case of a cavity in a liquid, the external pressure of the liquid is greater than the internal vapor pressure. And the Kelvin equation is as given by equation 23. So what are the consequences of the Kelvin equation? Firstly, there is a growth of larger drops at the expense of smaller ones. Let's take a spherical liquid drop in contact with its vapor, um, which has equal red eye of curvature within the liquid phase and are said to be positive. According to the Kelvin equation for this case, then the drop's vapor pressure will be greater than that of the planar surface. So for this, for, for, for the case of the smaller drop, uh, what actually happens is the smaller the drop, the higher the, the vapor pressure and vice versa. And as a result, smaller drops evaporate faster than larger ones. And this causes the larger ones to grow at the expense of the smaller ones. And this is given the fact that the system is made up of a mixture of of droplets of various sizes. And I should have mentioned to you that this is how the rain results and crystals form in solution in a process known as digestion and or osport ripening. <clears throat> Another consequence of the Kelvin equation is the self-nucleation or um, homogeneous nucleation of a new phase. Let's take, for instance, formation of minute bubbles of vapor in superheated liquid. Very small nuclei or embryos of the new phase form 
in the old phase. The nuclei undergo further growth as time progresses until the process is complete. In this case, the Kelvin equation gives the critical size in terms of equation 24 uh, for the value of p sub 2 of g all over p sub 1 of g and at a given temperature. But this does not indicate whether or not such a drop is likely to form at the prevailing conditions. Another consequence of the Kelvin equation is capillary condensation, which occurs when there is absorption of the vapor in a capillary tube, which has a very small red eye of curvature. And this is a capillary tube here, and this is vapor condensing in it. This is an amplified version, um, an amplified version of this. R sub 2 and R sub 1 represent the radar of curvature of the meniscus that forms on top of the column of the condensed liquid. And what actually happens is that the radar of curvature lies in the vapor phase because the vapor pressure of the liquid is lower than that of the corresponding planar liquid surface. So the Laplace equation uh, for the system after condensation can be given by equation 25, where all symbols re retain their known meaning. This equation can be further expanded to equation 26, where R sub 1 and R sub 2 are not equal. In this case, condensation instead of um, absorption occurs when the actual vapor pressure is higher than the calculated vapor pressure from the curving equation for the curved interface, which is considered as the equilibrium vapor pressure. The Kelvin equation shows that the equilibrium vapor pressure can be significantly lower than the planar surface pressure. Um, so that condensation may occur at P sub 2 all over that of G divided by P of 1 of G less than 1. Another consequence of surface tension is capillary, capillarity and wicking, so to say. Um, capillarity and wicking. Capillarity is the rising against gravity or falling of the liquid in a thin capillary once it is submerged vertically in it. The smaller the capillary, the higher the rise and vice versa. For liquids that rise, the adhesive forces um, between the liquid and the capillary are higher than the cohesive forces between the liquid molecules themselves. For liquids that fall, the adhesive forces between the liquid and the capillary are less than the cohesive forces between the molecules of the liquid themselves. We can um, it's a case where there is an inversion of poles, that is, multiple capillaries of the porous material, uh, liquids. Capillarity, that is when there is one capillary involved, and weakening when there are several capillaries. Uh, you can view it in that way, if you like. And weakening is a consequence of capillary action and has various applications, including in thin layer chromatography, the action of handkerchief that will clean our sweat, absorption of water by, from the soil by plants, and etc. This is a case of thin glass capillaries in water. The adhesive forces are greater than the cohesive forces, and there is a rise. And the smaller the capillary, the higher the rise. 
this has small red eye, uh, reddish rather, and this has slightly larger reddish, and this has the largest. This can be compared with the same thing capillaries in Mercury, where the adhesive forces are less than the cohesive forces. And the same thing happens the smaller the capillary, the lower the fall, and vice versa. Let's take one of the capillaries, any of them, and amplify it and see what happens. Yeah, so this is what we have, the capillary in submerged vertically um, in a liquid, in a container, say a beaker. And there is a rise up to a height h. This is the radius of the capillary. And this is the amplified version of this. And these vertical arrows represent surface tension force. And theta is the uh, contact angle the meniscus make, uh, the liquid meniscus make with, this is called a meniscus, make with the um, capillary wall. So let F sub ST be the surface tension force. Theta represents the angle between the glass and the liquid. Rho, density of the liquid. H, um, which is this, height of liquid in the tube, gamma sub LA, surface tension of the liquid, small letter M, mass of liquid in the tube, V, volume of liquid in the tube, um, that is from here to there, L, length of surface tension force, which is the circumference of the capillary tube which is equal to 2 uh, pi r. So, while in the tube, the liquid column is supported by surface tension forces. In other words, the surface tension forces are responsible for sustaining the liquid column um, uh, to stand rather than fall back into the bulk liquid. On the other hand, the weight of the liquid column is pulled by gravity, so uh, the weight of the liquid column tends to resist surface tension forces and tries to oppose the standing of this liquid column. So at equilibrium, the weight of the liquid column is balanced by the surface tension forces. So surface tension force is equal to weight of the liquid column. So the surface tension force, if it's resolved in the vertical component, is F sub ST times cos theta. And is the mass of the liquid column times the acceleration due to gravity gives the weight of the liquid column. However, it's impossible to uh, measure the mass of the liquid column, but we can readily obtain the volume of the liquid column from the dimensions of the liquid um, of the capillary. And we can also, we also know the density of the liquid, so we can relate the mass of the liquid column to the volume and density. If we did that, we obtain this expression. Of course, this represents the surface tension force, surface tension times length of surface tension uh, times cos theta, where this represents the surface tension force. Equal to density times volume, uh, which represents the mass of the liquid times the acceleration due to gravity. Our next task now is to obtain expression for the length of surface tension force and the volume of the liquid column. For this, 
is equal to the circumference of the uh, capillary tube. This we can obtain from the volume of a cylinder um, uh, pi r squared h because we have r, we have h there. So we can approximate the volume to the, the volume of this cylinder between this place and this place. Um, say a cylinder, although it's a column, but that's the best uh, approximation we can make. That gives equation 30. Uh, that is, we substitute this for that, we substitute this for V. We make H the subject of the formula, we obtain equation 31. And for the case of clean glass and water, theta is equal to zero, and cos zero is equal to one, and equation 31 becomes 32. For the case of clean glass and mercury, theta is not equal to zero, and cos theta is therefore not equal to one. And this is what we have here, and equation 33 is used to calculate the fall height. Um, H um, uh, prime. This is equation 33. Another consequence of surface tension is the ability of insects to walk on the surface of water. Let's take uh, the case of uh, insects walking on water. This is supported by surface tension forces. <clears throat> Without surface tension forces, without the support of surface tension forces, many, the, many insects won't be able to walk on water, as you see them if you visited the pond. So consider the case of a water strider walking on the surface of a liquid. <clears throat> yeah, so this is the length of the tessel segment touching the surface of the water, uh, represented by L. Because the legs are covered with hair, they are made effectively not wetted. While on the water, the tassel segment uh, past the radius of R, should I mention it, rests on the free surface. And as a result, the free surface makes an angle with the horizontal of theta due to the depression. The body weight of the strider, the body weight of the strider is supported by a combination of buoyancy and curvature forces. Uh, the surface tension, gamma sub LA, of the liquid produces an upward force on the water that tends to restore the water to its normal shape. For the equilibrium case of the water strider, if we resolve the surface tension um, in the horizontal axis, this is what we have. Two times gamma sub LA times cos uh, sine theta times P. We say two because there are two surfaces. Uh, the let's come back. The surface tension acts that way and acts this way. This way is not drawn anyway, but that's what happens. That's why you have two of them there. So equal to M G where M is the mass of the water strider and G is the acceleration due to gravity. And P equal to 12 L because firstly, um, let's return to the water strider. If you look here, this is, let's say this is one, two, three, four, five, six. There are six legs, no problems. But if you look at the 
the, the perimeter of the legs, you have two of them, it's very poor. One this way, one the other way. That is, this way, surface is, is, is making contact with the liquid, and that's water, and that way is making another contact with the liquid. That's why we now have uh, 12L. Yeah, so, P equal to 12 times L combined contact perimeter of the tarsal segment provided all of them are equal and mass of the strider. Another consequence of surface tension uh, is floating on the surface of water. A sewing needle, for instance, is able to uh, 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 float on the surface of water. Uh, due to the support of surface tension. Let's, see, uh, let's, let's take a look at this. This is a sewing needle on the surface of water. It's floating quite perfectly rather than sinking into the bulk liquid. Um, so here is a cartoon of what happens. There is a depression making a contact angle of theta, and this is the length of the needle. So this is the forces that act on the needle while on the surface of the liquid, what so to say. Surface tension force acts that way and acts this way. This is, this is the depression angle of theta, both sides. And this sort of pulls the needle into the liquid why the surface tension forces oppose um, the liquid. Uh, the surface tension forces oppose the weight of the liquid. Sorry, the weight of the needle. At equilibrium, these forces balance out. So if we resolve the surface tension forces um, in the vertical component, this is what we have. F so S T equals theta equal to gamma sub L A L um, up to L cos theta, where L is the length of the surface tension, uh, which is actually the length of the needle. At equilibrium, then we have this equal to the weight of the needle, and the maximum mass occurs when cos theta is zero. Uh, it occurs when theta is zero, not cos theta. The maximum mass occurs when theta is zero. <clears throat> of course, theta is equal to one um, when theta is zero. So we substitute that there, and we obtain the maximum mass of the needle as in equation 36. Two times um, gamma sub L A times L, which is the length of the needle, all over the acceleration due to gravity. And thanks for watching. Links to the PDF version of this video are in the uh, link to the PDF version of this video is in the video description.